This is my studio in late 2020. And as you can see, I've been using four Samson S-Patch patch bays with balanced track connectors. They're built entirely from metal and are usually very reliable. However, like all jack based patch bays, they're suffering from one particular design issue, which is that each time you're patching, you're creating a brief short circuit. Also, due to the slightly varying shape of jack connectors, the patching sometimes resulted in bad contact, so I had to wiggle the cable a few times to finally establish good contact. In order to get rid of all these issues, for a long time, I thought about getting this. Kilmetti is a Swiss manufacturer for high-end patch base. They're using an unconventional design to realize very reliable balanced audio patch base. The patch panels are very thin and also very lightweight. They come in various variations, each with different connectors on the backside, like D-Sub, Molex, BNC or Wago. For my studio environment, I favored the one shown here with solder lux. The only thing that kept me from buying Gilmetti patch base from the start was their fairly high price. Even the small normaling plugs or the solder lux cost between 3 and 4 euros a piece and you will need at least 32 normaling plugs and 64 solder lux for a 32 point patch bay. Patch cables aren't cheap either, so going the Gilmetti way can be quite costly. You can probably imagine how happy I was when I managed to find a very cheap offer for two of these patch bays including all the solder lux and all the normaling plugs plus 20 of those expensive patch cables all for just 800 euros. I bit the bullet and bought the package knowing that now during Covid isolation would be the best opportunity for a great overhaul of my entire studio cabling. The little oddity I found is that the solder lugs had been depicted inserted into the patch bay upside down in the advertisement pictures on the Thoman website. Actually, they have to be plugged in this way, otherwise you will mess up the signal's pin assignment. I have to admit that for me soldering is the most annoying thing you can do in a studio. However, I was very much looking forward to using the Gilmetti patch base and finally getting rid of all these little glitches associated with the Samson patch base. It took me four days to complete the entire recabling process. And there was a huge amount of cables which were no longer needed. For the first time in 10 years, I even tidied up the huge cabling mess behind my control room desk. Now let's take a look at these very special Gilmetti plugs. What is it all about? What about this weird pin design? In fact, you have three pins just like with other regular balanced connectors. The only difference is that they are arranged in a diagonal configuration. While the little white normaling plugs only have three pins, the patch cable connectors have a fourth pin. But this pin isn't used electrically. It only ensures that you plug in the cable with the correct orientation, not to mess up the signal's polarity. Solder lugs come with a capital G indicating the ground pin. The pin in the middle is for the reverse signal, thus the cold pin, number 3, and the one on the right is pin 2, which carries the hot signal. As Gilmetti devices build their own ecosystem connector-wise, it's a smart idea to build some XLR adapters to allow interfacing conventional gear. Admittedly, it hurts quite a bit to cut a 30 euros Gilmetti cable in half. Let's take a look under the hood of my studio furniture. In this rack we can see the 2 gigabit Cisco switches which manage my studio's Dante network. In 
the rack next to that we can see the back side of the Gilmetti patch base. Gilmetti patch bays are only about 2 cm deep, thus only a little bit deeper than this fake XLR patch bay, which is only there to cover the open space above the Gilmetti patch bays. You really need to apply some considerable force to pull out a soldering lug. When plugged in place, each of the three pins passes two beryllium bronze ribbons which bend and then compress their very smooth gold-plated surface with a very precise force of 4.5 Newton against the pins. In this case, the cable comes from an unbalanced output of a digital satellite TV receiver. So only two pins, the ground pin and the hot pin, are actually used. Once entirely inserted, they firmly stay in place with absolutely no play. Contacts are actually cleaned whenever you insert or unplug something. After finishing recabling and soldering, I had gone from a whopping 192 patch points on the Samson patch base down to only 64 patch points with the Gilmetti patch base. While this provides just enough patch points for my needs, I decided to replace one of the two 32 point patch base with a 48 point one to have a few spare patch points. I was lucky again to find a very good offer for a 48.1 in mint condition. Finally, I installed an IKEA LED bar to nicely illuminate the patch base. Given the price of Gilmetti patch cables, it's a smart idea to put some effort into laying out the patch base in a manner that you can get away with using as many of the much cheaper normaling plugs as possible. In my current layout, I try to get as many standard audio connections going without even using a single patch cable. Let's have a closer look at how the normaling plugs are actually used. When inserted into the bottom row, a normaling plug will automatically establish a connection between the output device, which is connected to the upper row at the rear of the patch bay, and a receiving input of another device connected to the bottom row on the rear panel. Splitting the signal of the outputting device to a second receiver is still possible using a patch cable. Plugging the normaling plug into the upper row will essentially prevent using this specific output. The signal won't be normalized to the device connected to the bottom row. By using a patch cable you can now send the signal of another device's output into this input. That's essentially all there is to it. Regarding the layout of my first patch bay, it starts with the patch points of three digital devices, followed by the outputs of a Yamaha stage piano and a Roland JV1080 MIDI sound module, followed by the main stereo output of my first SSL6 and the MS output of the Avenson midside, Next we have 6 lines coming from my first recording booth, followed by 12 outputs of my second larger recording booth, and finally 2 lines coming from the guitar amp isolation booth. Then we have the main out of the second SSL6, normalized into the first 6s inputs 11 and 12, then 4 Reaper hardware output sends to be able to process Reaper tracks with analog hardware, and finally my go-to tracking chain, cleverly set up in a way so that the output of one device is automatically normalized into the input of the following device of the desired chain. While the upper 48-point patch bay essentially normals incoming source signals originating from whatever room or whatever device into various preamps, the second patch bay essentially normals all those preamp outputs into dedicated inputs of the converter. This makes all sources in my studio appear as dedicated inputs on any track in my door, so that I can conveniently choose which source to record. Let me show you how it's possible to even patch phantom power across a Gilmetti patch bay without any issues. I'm taking a normaling plug 
and plug the signal coming from my AKG C414 condenser mic into the input of a phantom powering device. The mic is immediately ready to use. As soon as I remove the normal ink plug, phantom power is no longer provided to the mic, so it's shutting down right away. Here you can see my LibreOffice spreadsheet, where I'm keeping track of the current layout of the two patch bays. Patch bay layout may change after the purchase of a new device, or if I change the preference for my go-to tracking chain. The spreadsheet also includes additional information about specific routings or other signal flow related particularities. One important piece of information is that if you ever cut in half a Gilmetti patch cable, you'll find a black and a white lead. The white one is carrying the hot signal, while the black one is carrying the cold signal. Surprisingly, this very important information cannot be found anywhere on the internet. Finally, here we have the printout of a second spreadsheet, which I'm then using to cut out the patch bay labels. All in all, I never regretted selling the Samson patch base. Since using the Gemetti patch base, I never had any of the issues I had with the Samson ones, so I can only recommend getting Gilmetti patch base. Keep in mind that they are even used in nuclear power plants due to their extreme reliability. Thanks for watching. See you next time.